couple of quick announcements that we need to share about what's going on this week. Uh, youth group does meet tonight, the youth, the junior high at 5, senior high at 6 o'clock. We have the mixed Bible study that will be uh, tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. I am not sure where they are, so you may need to uh, touch base here at the office um, or uh, give, um, let's see, who would be the person you need to contact? I would say Georgiana, uh, Georgiana uh, Mills would probably know where they're meeting. I know they've been kind of rotating around. Last week it was at Phyllis Williams' house, so you could also contact Phyllis if you needed to. Uh, the men are going to have their midweek Bible study tomorrow evening here at the church at 7 o'clock. So I hope to see you at that time. Are there any other announcements for the good of the congregation that need to be shared? Did I miss anything? Okay, I think we're good then. Right. Well, I, I do want to uh, share with you this morning a video, and it actually is going to tie in to the message. Um, a few years ago, we did uh, Alpha Groups, and it's, it's been quite a few years, I think about 10 or more years ago, that we ran these Alpha courses. We may yet begin to run those again. They're just great, uh, great uh, courses in basic Christianity, and uh, they have a website and they have uh, testimonies of people's lives who have been radically changed as they have encountered Jesus Christ. And uh, so I'd like to share with you the testimony of Shane Taylor. Now his accent is pretty thick. He's from England, but he's uh, probably from the East End of, of London. So he's got a really thick accent. If you look, we've got subtitles that, that go with that. Actually, I think his accent's kind of cool. But um, it, it, again, he's got a very powerful story, and it, it just gears right in message, right in with the message this morning. So uh, let's go ahead and take a look at that this morning. I got in with the wrong crowd, and I started to um, pinch cars, burgle houses, uh, become known, me and my friends become known as very high profile thieves, really. I used to carry big knives, uh, the, the big knives to the smaller knives down my waist. And I was the kind of person where if you pulled a knife out, I would use it. I ended up stabbing someone in the head. I ended up um, stabbing someone just missing his heart and going through the top of his shoulder, uh, the, the top of his chest and his shoulder away. He dropped to the floor. and So I was on the run for two attempted murders. And then I was just, when I went to prison, I had such a hatred for the system and I couldn't handle being told what to do, couldn't handle prison officers mucking me about. When I went out on association, I got the prison officer and I, uh, I stabbed him. And then this led to me going into maximum security prisons, being put on CSC. It's where they feed you through a hatch in the door. There's no physical contact, so they have to have ride shields and ride gear on. Um, and that was my life for a long, long time, basically. And I, I just was going from prison to prison, prison to prison. But then I ended up going to Long Larton in Worcestershire. And when I was in there, I ended up going in an Alpha course. Never heard of an Alpha course, didn't know anything. And I just remember walking in because they'd sent me down. I sat down on a chair and I thought, oh no, it's a Christian thing. And we'd just go there every week and I would argue. And the pastor, um, I remember he come to me. He said, right, I'm gonna say a few scriptures first before we pray. And one of them was, no one's righteous, not one. We all fall short of the glory of God. And then he said the verses about Jesus and explained a bit why he died on the cross for sinners and stuff. And then he said, pray. So I started praying and I said, uh, God, I said, God, if you're real, come into my life because I hate who I am. And nothing happened, but then as I was talking to the pastor, I started to feel this energy feeling in my stomach. And it started to raise up and raise up and raise up and raise up. And I just broke out into uncontrollable um, tears. And I just sobbed. <clears throat> and I just... Right there. Because that was a change in my whole life. I knew God was real. Um, 
and no one will change that now. And then I remember <laughs> running on the wing. People clearly knew that I would become a Christian. So I actually helped them on another two Alpha courses. And then I, I, um, I got released. I've been in a prison where I, because you would have thought that the prison where I stopped the prison officers would have been the last prison to have me. But they were the first, that's how good works. The best thing for me is going in prisons and helping the lads in prison and, and trying to tell them about God. I've got um, four kids and then my life. Um, and what upsets me is because now I know um, that back then, if I had the kids, uh, they wouldn't have had a good upbringing. And now they sit on the night and have Bible studies with their dad. Um, <clears throat> have Bible studies with a dad, have a life, the beautiful, um, and my life, and it's probably it's my wife and my kids are the best gift, that, apart from the grace God's given me, is the best gift I've ever, he'll ever give me. Didn't expect to cry like that. Recovered now. So focus on that, that phrase he said about the life that, that God had given him, a, a brand new life. Just an unbelievable testimony. Isn't it? It's great to hear stories about how people have encountered Jesus Christ in a personal way and their lives have been totally transformed. Well, we're going to have our time of prayer. And of course, we want to continue to pray for our country and uh, the, the recovery from COVID, as well as uh, the unrest in our cities. And we do have an additional prayer request that, or I should, I should give you a couple updates real quickly. Um, the folks that we prayed for last week that had surgery um, did very well. Um, Norm and Mike are both recovering well from their surgery. Uh, Dave Lewis, who is a personal trainer for a number of us in our congregation, um, his surgery went beautifully. Uh, he's in uh, some pain, but he's doing quite well after his back surgery. And I know Ava, uh, Ava's mom is doing well after her knee surgery. So a lot of answered prayers. And so with, with that uh, uh, behind us, we want to be praying for Jacob Anthony. Jacob is Evelyn Winter's new great-grandson, born Saturday the 18th in Chicago. Uh, he was born early and had some breathing problems. Uh, X-ray shows that he has pneumonia, and they're moving him to the uh, NICU. And he'll probably be in the hospital for a week. Uh, her mom will likely be going home on, on Monday. So we, we just want to pray for, uh, for, for the family, for everybody, but especially for little Jacob. What a rough way to get started, huh? They have to spend that time in the NICU. So I'll give you some time. There's probably some things on your heart that you want to lift before the Lord. And I'll give you a moment to pray silently. And then let's just agree in prayer together for these things that I've mentioned. Let's pray our hands. Father, we give you thanks and praise for this gorgeous day. We thank you, Lord, for the life that we have in you. Lord, what a great testimony we just heard from Shane. And Lord, it, it encourages us. And, and Father, we just want to praise you for, for this wonderful work that you have done in his life. And we know that that is multiplied many times every day people are coming to you lord we pray that your spirit would be working working in the hearts of those um, who are estranged from you that they would come to know you lord and we know that so many in our cities where these rioting where the rioting is occurring lord they don't know you they don't know you as Father and as Savior. And, and Lord, this is one of the key reasons, the core reasons why they're acting the way they are. 
we pray, Holy Spirit, that that you would that you would encounter them, that they would encounter you, and that like shame, their lives would be transformed in the midst of all of their anger and rebellion and violence. And Lord, uh, we do pray for our country as it continues to struggle with the effects of this pandemic. Lord, we, we pray that you would supernaturally intervene and God, that, that you would cause this virus to completely dissipate. Lord, deliver us. Deliver us from this evil, Heavenly Father. We are so dependent upon you. Lord, we thank you for the good news about all the folks that we prayed for in the last week who've come through their surgeries very well and are beginning their recoveries. Continue to watch over them. Lord, we would uh, today agree specifically in prayer for Jacob Anthony. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would strengthen him even now, Holy Spirit. Minister to him as he is in the NICU. Strengthen his lungs, God. Cause him to be able to breathe easily and cause all the fluid that is in his lungs just to, to, to slough off, Heavenly Father. We pray that you would be with the physicians and the nurses working on him, that you would bless them in their skill, use them, Lord, that he might uh, receive the healing that he needs. We pray that you'd be with his parents. Lord, we, we can't imagine the worry that, that they are experiencing, but we pray that you would replace their worry, their concern with your trust and your hope and your peace. Lord, we, we pray that quickly now that little Jacob would be able to go home just as his mom is going home tomorrow. Lord, we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. And it's Jesus who's taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, power, and glory forever. Amen. Can we stand together now? We're going to join in our Psalter for the day, and it's Psalm 16. And following that, if you remain standing, Amy's going to lead us in our a praise chorus, the servant song. Let's sing. And this is responsive. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. gives me counsel. Even at night my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. The Lord is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad and my soul rejoices. My body also dwells secure. You show me the path of life.
in his New York Times bestseller, Between the World and Me, Tanishi Coates, um, an African-American writer who's written for The Atlantic and The New York Times, and I think he also has actually written a number of comic books for Marvel and helped create the Black Panther comic books and, and did the writing for the latest movie of, of that genre. He writes uh, this book-length letter to his adolescent son, Samori, and it's a, a sober word of caution to his son about uh, how hard he believes it will be for him to grow up as an African-American male. Racism, Coates writes, is a visceral experience that rips at the black body. Now, does he hope things will get better? Actually, no. Hope, he says, hope is hollow. And he makes it clear. He has no hope in God. He has no hope in the church, none whatsoever. Yet, toward the end of his book, he recounts this conversation that he had with Dr. Mabel Jones, who was a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ and the daughter of sharecroppers in rural Louisiana. Dr. Jones, it turns out, and she uh, went on to serve in the Navy, became a successful radiologist. She had a daughter and a son named Prince who became friends with Coates. And one evening, a police officer confused Prince with another African-American young man and shot and killed him. And as Coates listened to Dr. Jones talk of what the church meant to her, in the midst of pain and suffering and injustice, he writes this. This is fascinating. This is a quote. He says, I thought of my own distance from an institution that has so often been the only support of our people. I often wonder if in that distance I missed something some notions of cosmic hope, some wisdom beyond my mean physical perception of the world, something beyond the body that I might have transmitted to you, son. I have wondered that because something beyond anything I have ever understood drove Mabel Jones to an exceptional life. Listen to that. I wondered because something beyond everything I have ever understood drove Dr. Mabel Jones to an exceptional life. I really do sincerely hope that Mr. Coates will wrestle with whatever it was, and we know what it was, that drove Dr. Mabel Coates to an exceptional life, and that he would reconsider the church, and most importantly, that he would reconsider the person of Jesus Christ, whom the church represents. I wish I could tell him, yes, yes, Mr. Coates, you've missed something. You've got to take a second look. I dare say that uh, Dr. Jones sounds exactly what Jesus Christ had in mind when he began to build or create his church, to create a community that makes those looking from the outside in do a double take and wonder what makes them different from everybody else and cause them to ask, am I missing something? Am I missing something? And I need whatever it is that they have. This morning, we're continuing in our One Thing series that we started at the beginning of the year. And we're focusing today on the question, what is the church? What is the church? Now, the Greek word for church is ekklesia, and it comes from the Bible. It literally means the called out ones, the called out ones, the church is the community of all true believers of all times. That is, the church is made up of men and women who have been, are, and ever will be the true believers of Jesus Christ. 
when Paul wrote in Ephesians that Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, he was referring to all the people that Jesus died to redeem. He didn't just mean those who were alive after Jesus died and was resurrected, but those who looked to God for their salvation before Jesus Christ ever arrived here on this planet. All true believers, regardless of what time period they live in, make up the true church. And the church, contrary to what some people would claim, it's not just another institution that has been dreamt up in the mind of man, but God. Its origins are divine. They aren't human. Jesus himself taught, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Building, after all, it was in his background, wasn't it? Um, the scriptures teach us that through him all creation was made, and it was fitting that he was born into a carpenter's family. Now, the actual Greek word in the Bible used for carpenter is the word tekton, tekton, which is more than just a carpenter, far more than just a carpenter. It means builder. Jesus was likely more like a contractor who worked with wood and stone and brick and mortar. You know, talking about brick and mortar, um, I'm fascinated with architecture. I love seeing buildings, and that includes church buildings as well, and I've seen quite a few in my lifetime. Uh, very old ones, very modern ones. Um, I remember visiting a church in Stoddard, New Hampshire, and the, the steeple there was erected on the day of the Battle of Bunker Hill. It was fascinating. I have walked through the column halls of St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City, an unbelievable structure, and I've toured the Crystal Cathedral out in Garden Grove, California. That's impressive, too, uh, for other reasons. Um, like these buildings, the church in one respect is visible. We can see it. There are people who publicly identify as church members. The churches of every stripe, they operate in various locations. Their works and, uh, can be observed, their beliefs and their teachings, their actions readily uh, identified. Sadly, as the saying goes though, look, looks can be deceiving. Looks can be deceiving. What's fascinating is not only is there a visible church, but the scriptures tell us there is also an invisible church. There is an invisible church, and the two are not always congruent. To borrow a word from last week's message, remember the word congruent, we talked about that. They don't always line up. The visible church and the invisible church do not always line up. And as Jesus said, indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. That's out of Luke 17, 21. Because we cannot see the spiritual condition of people's hearts, the true church in its spiritual reality as a fellowship of all genuine believers is in fact invisible. It's invisible. Only God can see the condition of people's hearts. You might remember out of the book of Samuel that... Uh, that the prophet says, God looks upon the heart. As Paul says in one of his letters, the Lord knows those who are his. The Lord knows those who are his. And in a couple of scripture passages, Jesus indicates that on the last day, he is going to separate the authentic church from the inauthentic church. And this is what the meaning is behind the parable of the sheep and the goats. Sheep and goats, they look very similar. They congregate together, but they're different animals. And as well, the same uh, communication is given through the wheat and the tares. The wheat and the tares, they look kind of similar, but one you can eat, the other you can't. So now having uh, made a distinction between the two manifestations of the church, 
We need to be very careful not to view everybody who claims to be a Christian with a suspicious eye. Are they really? Are they really believers? As biblical scholar Wayne Grudem recommends, we should consider all to be members of the universal church who appear to be believers from their confession of faith and their pattern of life. So if it looks like their confession of faith and their pattern of life line up, we can say, yep, they truly are followers of Jesus Christ. In addition to these, uh, there are other helpful descriptions of the church uh, following Pentecost, uh, gatherings that met in people's homes, very small gatherings, maybe eight or 12 people. They were called the church. Gatherings of larger groups in cities were identified as the church. As a matter of fact, there were whole regions where it, they were identified as the church. Like, for instance, in the, the region of uh, um, Cappadocia, they, that, that was seen as, as a church, as well as those living throughout the entire world. Everybody in the whole world is considered a part of the church if they look to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. All of these were rightfully identified as the church, and they still are. Um, there are two particularly powerful images used to describe God's church that uh, could bring such healing to our nation if they were embraced. And the first is the church is a family. The church is a family. Uh, this is what St. Paul writes. He says, Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Treat younger men like brothers, older women like mothers, younger women like sisters in all purity. That's out of 1 Timothy 5. Paul also speaks about there being full equality. Full equality in God's family. There is to be no favoritism. There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Jesus Christ. You are all one in Jesus Christ. Um, pastor was asked, this is quite a time ago, to go to a church to conduct a revival meeting. And it was in the back hills of South Carolina. This was back in the 1950s when segregation was uh, practiced and there were tensions between black and white. Those were very strong tensions. And when he took his place behind the pulpit to preach his first sermon of the weekend, the guest preacher looked over the crowd and much to his surprise, the congregation was this even mix of black and white folks. He couldn't believe what his eyes saw as he gazed upon the congregation. And he wondered, how could such a thing happen? How could this be? In South Carolina, 1950s South Carolina, and following the service, he asked the old hillbilly preacher who was the pastor of the church, how did you guys get this way? How did you get this way? And the old preacher said, what? What way? And the guest said, you know what I'm talking about. How did you get integrated? Blacks and whites together. Has this come about because of the Supreme Court decision on integration? And the old preacher said, Supreme Court? What do Christians have to do with the Supreme Court? Come on, said the guest preacher. You know you have one weird church here. How did you get to be this way? Well, said the preacher, they uh, used to have about 20 members in this church when the last preacher died. And, but there were there are hundreds, there are hundreds and hundreds of people now, said the guest preacher. That's right, agreed the old preacher. When the last preacher died, they could not get anybody to replace him. And so I said, after a couple of weeks, I'll be the preacher. I'll preach. I got up the next Sunday, opened the Bible, put my finger down, and it landed on the verse that says, In Christ there is no Jew or Greek. All are one in Jesus Christ. So I preached on that. 
And I told them people how Jesus makes all kinds of people one. And when I finished, the deacons told me that they wanted to talk with me in the back room. And when the deacons got there, they told me, we don't even want to hear that kind of preaching no more. What did you do then? Asked the guest. He said, well, I fired them. <laughs> if the deacons not going to deep, they need to be fired. And the guest preacher was amazed. How come those deacons didn't fire you? He said, they never hired me. You know, once... I found out what bothered them people. I gave it to them every week. I put that knife in the same place Sunday after Sunday. Did they put up with it? The guest preacher asked. Not really, the old preacher answered. I preached that church down to four people. Four. Sometimes, he says, revival begins not when we get a whole lot of new people into the church, but when we get a whole lot of the old people out of the church. If people are going to stand in the way of the moving of God, it's better that they be gone. After that, we only let Christians into this church. How can you tell? How can you tell which ones are Christian? The guest preacher wanted to know. Well, he said, uh, down here we're taught since knee high to a grasshopper that there are differences between black folks and white folks, and they should never mix. But we know that when people get saved, all of that garbage about race is gone. We know that we've got Christians on our hands when all that stuff about race is taken out of folks' hearts. Well, when we got some Christians in this church, it just started growing and growing and growing. And that's how we got to be the way we are today. The church is a family. And it brings me great joy to know that I have brothers and sisters in the Lord that are of a vast ethnic mosaic. And we're going to be together forever. In the house of God. In the Father's house. The church is also comparable to a body. And you've heard this before. All believers are members of one body. Jesus is the head. Every member is unique as well as indispensable. And endowed with various gifts. Various talents. And we're meant to live side by side. With, uh, benefiting one another mutually. Uh, just as the entire body is benefited by the hand, the entire body is benefited by the foot and the leg and the arm and every specialized organ and structure throughout. So we understand who makes up the church. We need to ask the question now, what makes the church a church? What makes the church a church? So just showing up here on Sunday mornings? Historically, most Christian leaders have agreed that there are two major activities that uh, marks uh, that uh, or, or marks that uh, distinguish every church as being an authentic church. And they have to be there in order to constitute an authentic church. The first is to correct preaching from the Bible. The correct preaching from the Bible. And here we're not talking about style. But we're talking about content of the message being communicated. If the messages in the church continually contain false doctrine or obscure the truth of the gospel message of salvation by faith alone in Jesus Christ, then the church in which those sermons are preached is not a true church. When I do premarital counseling with couples, we talk about a lot of things, but one of the things we talk about, spend quite a bit of time on, is the importance of getting plugged into a local fellowship of believers, into a good church in their community. And I tell them, you know, this is a Methodist church, but um, the, the community that you're in, maybe, uh, maybe you don't have a Methodist church, maybe you don't have a good Methodist church, but maybe you've got a great Baptist church. Go there, plug in there. Maybe it's a Presbyterian church or an Episcopalian church. Plug in. It doesn't matter what denomination it is. The thing that does matter 
is do they honor the Word of God? Do they honor the Word of God and do they preach the Gospel? Uh, unfortunately, not all churches do that. They don't. Neither does every denomination do that. Great care must be exercised when choosing a local church to join. The second mark of the true church is the correct administration of the sacraments. And in the Protestant tradition, this means baptism, of course, and the Lord's Supper. Baptism is the observance that identifies a person as a member of Christ's church. And the Holy Supper serves as a way for members to continue to show their good standing in the church body. A church that neglects these two things, baptism and Holy Communion, cannot be considered an authentic church. And now in the time remaining, we need to answer the last question at hand. What is it that a church does? What is it that a church is supposed to do? You know, if you join a scrapbooking club, what are you going to do? You're going to scrapbook, right? If you join up with a local softball league, what is it that you're going to do? You are going to be playing softball, right? If you affiliate with the Kiwanis International or the Rotary, what are you going to be investing your time and resources and energy in? Well, improving local communities and particularly the lives of children. We know what the answer is to what these organizations do. How would you answer somebody if they asked you right now, what is the church supposed to do? What is the church supposed to do? Well, there's one very easy way to remember it. Three words, upward, inward, outward. Upward, inward, outward. The church is supposed to minister first to God, upward. Secondly, to its members, inward. And thirdly, outward to the whole world. In, first, or in Colossians 3.16, Paul encourages the church to sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thanksgiving in your heart to God. Worship. Worship in the church is not merely a preparation for something else. It is in itself the fulfillment of a key major purpose of the church whose members were created to live for the praise of God's glory. Worship is your ministry to God. And the church's ministry to its members is done through nurturing, through building them up through coming alongside and spending time with them so the church can be pre or present everyone mature or complete in Jesus Christ. That's what Paul writes in Colossians 1.28. The church, when it ministers to each other, presents everyone mature or complete in Jesus Christ. And the church's ministry to the world is done through sharing the good news with everyone that we possibly can. It's accomplished not only through our speaking, but it's accomplished as well in tandem with our good deeds, especially our deeds of mercy, helping those who are hurting or who are in some kind of need in this life. In reaching upward, inward, outward, the church gives the world a foretaste of the age to come. That is so important. I want us to understand that. Why do we exist? In reaching upward, inward, and outward, the church gives the world a foretaste of the age to come when Jesus Christ will return and his rule and reign over the whole earth will be fully known and experienced. A time when people's lives will be fully transformed and restored, and all things will be made new, a time when we know firsthand peace on earth and goodwill, not just from God, but for each other. And that is exactly what Jesus Christ did on his first visit, isn't it? 
He described what he was all about to his cousin John, who was in prison and having second thoughts about Jesus. Jesus tells John's disciples, go back, tell him this. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. And the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Now, when you look at that list, what is most striking to you? What's most dramatic? It's easy. It's the raising of the dead, right? The raising of the dead. Wouldn't that be an awesome thing to see? I think we saw that this morning, didn't we? In that testimony of Shane's. Raising the dead. As C.S. Lewis wrote, Jesus did not come to make bad people good. That is a big thought today. A lot of people think that's why Jesus came, to make bad people good. Jesus came to make dead people live. That's why he came. Jesus Christ came to make dead people live. And St. Paul affirms the natural state of humanity in Ephesians 2. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. That's the whole condition of the world. We're dead, spiritually dead in our sins. But in Christ, in Christ, you and I are brought back to life. That's what he does. And that is exactly what Jesus Christ designed the church. That's why he has built the church to accomplish the task of bringing dead people back to life. That is exactly what the church did for Shane Taylor. You know, Shane may not have been physically dead, but he was dead to God. And for that matter, he was dead in a way to those around him. You ever wonder what the church is supposed to be about? Remember Shane's story. And imagine if Bell Point. If Bell Point Community Church could have that kind of impact week in, week out, every week we would hear a story about how God worked through one of us to bring somebody back from the dead into life. How awesome would that be? Oh man, that'd be so exciting. I'd probably have to cut my messages in half or maybe do, with, uh, do away with them all together. And uh, we'd be begging. Tell us another story. Tell us another story about how God brought this person back from the dead. Something tells me I think that God would actually prefer it that way. Let's pray. Oh Lord, our dear Heavenly Father, help us. Help us to be your church, your called out ones. Help us, empower us to faithfully be reaching upward, reaching inward, and reaching outward. Use us, God. Use us as you intended to change the world and raise the dead. Amen. Will you stand with me and we'll join in our closing hymn.
see you soon. Hi, I'm Pastor Paul, pastor at Bell Point Community Church, and we're so glad that you joined us this morning for worship. Hope that it has been an uplifting experience for you. And so you don't miss any of our future worship services, we would encourage you to subscribe to our channel. God bless you.